friends, welcome to another episode of Her Hoop Stats Unplugged. Happy New Year. We've made it to 2022. Hopefully going to be a better year than the last two years, but there's definitely going to be a lot of exciting college basketball Despite all the COVID pauses we've seen since the holidays, there's been a ton of great games over the past few weeks. Before we get into that, some quick announcements. Unplugged is moving to a new day. We are no longer releasing on Friday like we have been in the past. We are moving to Monday, which is great news because Sundays have been action-packed in the women's college basketball world. So we will definitely be getting to that in detail every week. Also, we are trying to do more video. So in addition to the podcast being available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening to us, we will be available on YouTube as well, fully in video. So if that's more your speed, definitely go check that out on our YouTube channel, along with all the other videos and podcasts that we've got up there. To kick off our 2022 podcast, I am here today with Calvin Wetzel from our Hoop Stats team. Hey, Calvin, how's it going? Hey, I'm good, Megan. How are you doing? Doing good. It's been a long day of basketball, a busy Sunday, but <laughs> it's an exciting day of basketball as well. I guess that's one of the perks of moving this to a Monday release is we get to break down all the big Sunday games that are coming. It seems like that's the case every week. Yeah, it feels like Thursday and Sunday, always always those days where we get those big time matchups. And we had, we had so many today, it's, it's hard to keep up, but that's it's a great problem to have. It's it's fun to have this much exciting basketball at once. Exactly. It's I feel like Thursday night and Sunday, it's hard to pick which games to watch because there are so many good ones. But like you said, good problem to have. Lots of exciting basketball that happened today. I feel like we have to start in the Pac-12 because going into today, there was two undefeated teams remaining in the country, Colorado and Arizona. We are down to one undefeated team. Arizona got knocked off by USC today. So a bit of a surprising loss, I think, for the Wildcats. They're number four in the country right now. I don't know that I would have had them that high. They haven't really played a lot of tough opponents since that Louisville game that they won in the opener. But I think still a pretty surprising loss for them today in the USC. They're without a couple of players due to, I believe, COVID protocols still, but still a pretty rough loss. Yeah, USC, you know, there's ring. We were talking about this beforehand, just outside the top 100, which if you're a power conference team, not where you want to be. And if you're a top 10 team, it's not who you want to be losing to. You know, it, it is always tough to evaluate these types of losses. Uh, like you said, with all the, the COVID different personnel issues that teams are having, um, you just never know. And especially Arizona, sort of, this wasn't their first game. Um, this was their second game back, but, but uh, they had that long pause they played Washington State a couple of days ago. Before that, they hadn't played since December 17th. So obviously still maybe a little bit of rust too, even if even if they would have been full strength. But uh, yeah, it's they're going to drop from number four. That's There's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I haven't really fully decided where I would like drop them to yet, but it's definitely a tough loss. But again, like you said, with so many pieces missing still from COVID, such a long pause, it is kind of hard to evaluate where some of these losses kind of really put these teams because they're just it's not the same as just like your standard regular season loss to 100 something opponent which you would be like yeah that's a really bad loss but I think there's just a lot of caveats going on with things right now and the, the way the landscape is but that does leave Colorado in the Pac-12 as the lone defeated team in the country and they got a pretty big win today they beat UCLA I think probably their best win so far so big win for them they were already receiving votes I expect that we will probably see them in the AP top 25 this week yeah you know I think it's been a few weeks uh they've been getting a lot of votes and they're sitting just outside right now they're definitely gonna definitely gonna crack the AP top 25 and it's it's a good team they deserve it until proven otherwise um we're, we're gonna get to see them obviously against some of these better teams like Arizona like Stanford coming up in the next next few weeks I think Stanford's this week uh their next game on the schedule you know bar COVID issues. You never know when you talk about these games coming up. Who knows what's going to happen? But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll we'll see if Colorado's for real. You know, once that once they get into the meat of that Pac-12 schedule against some of those teams, we thought UCLA maybe would be one of those games. But you know, COVID or not, I think I think it's become clear that maybe UCLA isn't in, isn't in that tier that we thought they would be. But the Pac-12 definitely has some tough opponents they'll be throwing at them pretty soon. In Oregon, if they get healthy, I know we'll get to them in a little bit, but that'll be another one Colorado has to go through if if they catch the Ducks. 
at full strength. So we'll we'll see if they're for, for real, but right now, um, just congrats because they deserve it. Maya Holling shed has been awesome. Um, you know, I, I love this team and it's pretty cool when the last undefeated team is a team like Colorado as opposed to a South Carolina or a UConn, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit exciting. It's not the team that anyone would have probably had circled to be the last undefeated team in the country. And like you said, they do take on Stanford on Friday. They did beat Stanford last year in that kind of like fluke game that Stanford had on the road where they had been, you know, traveling on the road for I don't know how many weeks at that point. But so they did take down Stanford last year. So I mean, it's not unheard of for them to beat them, but I mean, that's going to be a tough game for them on Friday, but either way, I think it's going to be a great measuring stick of where this Colorado team actually is. Yeah, I think, was that game overtime or double overtime? It uh, might have been, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, think it, uh, I think it went to overtime, and that was one of those, like you said, a little bit of a fluke game, but but definitely some history. So this is a game I have circled on my calendar, especially on a day where, you know, on Friday is, is all about the Pac-12. We talk about Thursdays and Sundays being the big women's basketball days, but I think Friday is really, really the big, big Pac-12 day in women's basketball. Yeah, I was very excited to have Pac-12 Fridays back this week. We got a really, well, I mean, Arizona, Washington State was a good game. And then we got a really good game, I thought, between Stanford and Oregon as well. Stanford won that one as expected, but Oregon definitely hung around. We got a chance to see a little bit more, not quite a full story Ducks team yet. We still haven't seen that, but at least some more healthy pieces. They have Rogers back, they have Pau Pau back, and they have Saboli back. Pau Pau and Saboli still playing a little bit of limited minute, minutes, but um, at least out on the floor for a good amount versus Stanford. And then they are now without Sedona Prince, who is in COVID protocol. So we still haven't quite seen it all together, but they had a good showing against Stanford. They hung around. I mean, Lexi Hole went off in that game. She scored 33 points, and they still were able to hang around with Stanford, who shot the three ball really, really well. Yeah, even if you take out Lexi Hall, who was seven for 10 from three, uh, you know, they, they still went, Stanford did five for 11 from three, almost 50%, um, which was a good shooting team, but that's always just a little bit of variation. Like you said, Oregon didn't exactly get run out of the gym, even, even when Stanford couldn't miss uh, Lexi Hall and the rest of the team. I'm really excited to see what they look like when Sedona Prince does come back. I hope she's back uh, a week from tomorrow. I guess today, by the time you release this, yeah. uh, Monday, MLK Day, matinee game. I will be there in Don't. Oregon, uh, <laughs> UConn versus Oregon. I'm, I'm really, I, I hope Sedona's back for that game. We'll see. But but with, with the exception of her, uh, they are, their backcourt is at full strength now. Like I said, and Dia Rodgers played 36, almost 37 minutes in this game, 33 for Pow Pow, 20, almost 29 for Sabali. So they're really, really starting to get, um, you know, some of, the, some of these players, not just back, but back to the point, you know, Pow Pow came back and played like four minutes in their first game back. Uh, really, the backcourt is to the point now where they're all at full strength and able, able to play, play their full minutes. With, and once they get Sedona back, this team, I do think we'll get back into the rankings and be, be definitely a contender. Yeah, I think so as well. I think we saw it against Stanford and it's only going to go up from here for them, especially when you think about these pieces haven't really had any game action together at this point. So it's going to take a little bit for things to gel, but there's a lot of talent on this team. And I think they're going to be hanging around with the best teams in the country very shortly. That UConn game is going to, I think, be a great one, especially if they have Prince back. And then UConn got Nika Mjolm back today. It sounds like AZ Fudd is making good progress. So I'm not sure if she'll be ready for that. Oregon game but if she is that should make it even more interesting and, and the other thing about Oregon too is that you know the committee the committee is just going to look at their whole body work that's what they have to do so their seed if they are at full strength coming into March their seed is not going to be reflective of the team that's going to be able to be on the floor at that point so whatever seed they are is I would not want to be the seed across from them because you're going to be playing someone a lot better than probably who you should be lined up with you know, if, if they do have all these pieces finally able to come back and play together for a month or so and start to gel, uh, someone's going to get a raw deal, whoever has to play them yeah. in the tournament. I think. Uh, just because that's, that, it's not going to be the only team that that happens to. That's sort of just how, how it works these days with COVID, unfortunately. The, the resumes sometimes just, just don't make sense because of personnel issues, but what are you going to do? So I'm, I feel sorry for whoever Oregon has to play, but um, it, we could see a seed line upset that's not an actual upset. Yeah, I very well could see that happening as well. It's going to be interesting, too, because the committee does take into consideration injuries, but it's like how much, like when they've been injured for a third of the season, like how much you take it into account. It'll be very interesting to kind of see how they handle some of these things, because 
yeah, they didn't have like this core pe players and a lot of those losses and now they're going to have them going into March. So how, I don't know how you wait that. It's tough. tough. I think there's a lot of teams that we can point to that they're going to have to figure that out with this year. But yeah, that, uh, that would help Oregon a little bit because they're going to get into the tournament either way yeah. injuries or, or COVID or not. So uh, if, it, if it is, you know, if that does come into play with their seed line, that will definitely help them and help someone else who maybe doesn't have to unfairly play them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it, I'm fairly certain it does factor into seed line because I think when you look at like a Maryland or a UConn that have some losses without key pieces, that's kind of why you'll see them maybe a little higher in the seeds than the resume might, might suggest because they'll take those injuries into consideration and that factor into some of those losses. Yeah, the tough thing though is this year, every single team that they're going to be evaluating is going to have yeah. some sort of personnel, even if there are no injuries, just some some game where someone missed due to COVID and it's it's basically universal by the time we get to March that will happen. So so how do they weigh one team's losses versus another team's right. losses? You can probably all agree the Oregon's had more than a lot of teams, but it'll be tough for them to sort of figure out who, to, who just where to weight all those different different personnel losses that teams have had. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting and see how much that does or doesn't end up affecting the bracket. Because like you said, it's happened to so many teams. It's gotten to a point where I think it's going to be very difficult for the committee to keep track of that like as they're going through and trying to see these teams. So it will be interesting to see kind of how that ends up shaking out. Yeah, and especially because last year, you know, COVID, we had all these COVID issues too. But basically, you had, last year, before the vaccine existed, you had a positive test on your team. The whole program shut down for like two weeks, right? So we didn't really have these teams who were still playing games while some of their players were positive and not on the court. Because if the players were positive, the team just didn't play. This year, we have teams, someone's positive, but the team is still playing. So instead of just not having a game, you're having games with missing pieces, which is a lot different because then you get losses that, that maybe would have been wins or blowouts that maybe would have been close. So it, it's a different, you know, it, the committee had a tough job last year too, but they have a tough job in a very different way this year, I think. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be very, very interesting, I think, to see how things get seated. I don't think we've had any history that can kind of help you predict, like, how they're going to handle this situation. So <laughs> it'll be very interesting, I think, on Selection Sunday. Or even, well, we're still supposed to get, I believe, those mid-season releases, at least on the top four lines. So when we get the first one, I think it's usually early February. That should be very interesting. Definitely. All right, so that's the Pac-12, but I mean, there's just been lots of action as well in the SEC this week, particularly South Carolina played two ranked games, one against LSU on Thursday and then against Kentucky today. South Carolina won both of those, but the LSU one was probably a little closer than most people expected it to be. Yeah, LSU only made one three, too, or one for seven from three in that game, still hung around, uh, you know, lost by six or within one possession coming into the fourth quarter. I anyone who maybe had questions about is LSU for real? Did they deserve that top 15 ranking? Um, in a loss, I think they showed that they do. Obviously, we all know Kim Mulkey was gonna get this program headed in the right direction. I think she's done a, maybe a little more quickly than most people thought. Uh, but but Kayla Pointer deserves a, a ton of credit too. How good has she been? She's uh, one of the one of those under under heralded players in the country, I think, and, and definitely deserves some deserves some more shouts. So. Um, it, this was a fun game to watch and LSU the SEC was probably already the deepest league in the country in my opinion last year and going into this year you make LSU competitive now uh, it's just it's just that much tougher yeah I agree I think as we headed into conference play this year people were like well maybe it's the ACC maybe it's the Big Ten it kind of feels like so far the SEC is still that league in, this, in the country right now LSU has been fantastic like you said, I think we expected Mulkey to get them there. I don't think I expected Mulkey to have a top 15 team at this point in the, her career at LSU. I didn't expect it this season, if we're being honest. But, I mean, they, they lose, but I don't think they should drop in the rankings at all. If anything, they should probably move up because they gave South Carolina a really tough time in this game. Yeah, I, I agree. I could see them dropping because I think voters love to drop teams after losses whether they deserve it or not. Although, to the voters' credit, they didn't drop South Carolina when they lost to Missouri. Yes. They didn't drop Stanford when they lost to South Carolina. So maybe they're starting to figure it out that a loss doesn't automatically mean you have to drop. Um, I, ho I hope they do the same with LSU and leave them right where they are. Because because I think I, our, our rating is them at 31 at this point. Uh, I would say that they're one of the teams that maybe our rating is a little bit low on. Yeah. Maybe You can make an argument below 13, but this is a top 25 team, no doubt about it, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I agree. I have a little teaser. I've got a bracketology thing coming out this week, and I think they're a two seed right now, which is really not something I would have thought I would have been saying at this point in the season. <laughs> Wild. Yeah, <laughs> I had to like check myself. I was like, is that reasonable? But I think it is. <laughs> But yeah, just a team I think that's definitely overperformed a great win against South Carolina. I think South Carolina looked a little off in that game. I thought they had looked, until this Kentucky game today, I thought they came out and played really well against Kentucky. But the last few games, I thought their defense just hadn't been quite as locked in. Their guards' decision-making, they've lost Olya Boston, kind of let her disappear a little bit at times. But I think we saw the opposite of that today. So I don't think there's any long-term concerns for South Carolina at this point they still very much look like the best team in the country no I, I think you know when you look at the Missouri game and that incredible Lauren Hanson shot and then LSU playing them close and that it obviously raises some some questions for some people like oh is South Carolina really the best team and they're really this dominant but to me though that sort of stretch is more uh, the takeaway is is that there is so much more parity in the game now than there was three, four, five years ago. We're never going to get that 2016 UConn type of run again. We're never going to get, you know, a team winning 100 straight games again, I don't think. And for most of us, maybe not for you, UConn fans, <laughs> most of us, that's a great thing. It's a great thing for just fans of the game. But to me, that's the takeaway. The takeaway isn't anything about South Carolina because they're still the best team and they're still dominant. It's just that every year now, the best team in the country is going to be a beatable team. And, and that's what we've seen, but they're also going to be a team that can beat ranked teams by 20 at their best. Like what we saw tonight. Yeah, exactly. No. And I do think that makes it more exciting, especially makes it more exciting when you come to March and as much as you're like, okay, South Carolina is the favorite to win the title. You're not like that. You 2016 team. Like you could have sharpened them into the final four in December like <laughs> you're not doing that this year and it makes it a lot more exciting that yeah they're still gonna be the favorite to win the title but it doesn't mean they couldn't get upset in like the elite eight or something yeah and so many other top teams have had losses or near losses like this too it's not just South mm -hmm. Carolina exactly. you know, it's, uh it's 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 just across the board it's the parity which is great because now Missouri's a great team. They're going to be a tournament team. They're, that's another team in the SEC that's a lot better than they were last year or the year before, which is awesome to see. Uh, but, but that's the type of team that, you know, is around the level maybe someone like South Carolina or Stanford could run into in the second round, right, in a one versus eight type of matchup. And if, if, if their ceiling for those eight or nine seeds, even if it takes overtime in, in a buzzer beater, is to beat the South Carolinas, they also were without Asia Blackwell, by the way. They didn't score in that game. They still did it. You never know what you're going to get, even in a one versus eight game. It used to be that we had to wait till like the one versus two game to get any really like you know meaningful scares for the one seed. Now you could get it much earlier, which is really exciting. Yeah, the tournament this year is going to be very exciting. I'm like, don't want to wish away the regular season, but the postseason is going to be just so much fun this year. I'm very much looking forward to it. Hopefully, somewhat in person if things calm down. <laughs> Absolutely, I am fully planning on being in Minneapolis. Um, I would be really disappointed. We, we lost out of New Orleans a couple of years ago. Yeah. Really didn't want to lose out again. So we'll see. <laughs> Keep crossed. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully we'll be there this year, though. As much as I've heard great things about Minneapolis, I don't know that Minneapolis in April is as exciting <laughs> as <laughs> New Orleans in April. A little bum uh, that we missed out on that and San Antonio is. Yeah, <laughs> and he was for I, Final Four. <laughs> I, would, I would make that trade in a heartbeat. But uh, <laughs> at this point, I'll take what I can get. Yeah, exactly. As long as I'm watching basketball, I will be happy. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. So not only was there a lot of SEC action today, there was also Big Ten action. Iowa versus Nebraska was a bit of a shootout, but a good game. I think we've seen this Nebraska team. They were undefeated for a while. They lost that game to Michigan State, which dropped them a little bit. But then they came out and beat Michigan on Thursday this week and now hung around with Iowa. So I think at this point, you could say that Nebraska is definitely one of those teams to keep an eye on in the Big Ten. Absolutely. I, I don't really care that they lost this game, to be honest. I think I think this is one of those losses that's going to keep them just hovering under everyone's radar still, which is where they've been for a while. And they definitely should be on the map at this point. But it might take, you know, another week or two for them to really get a big win. Maybe it's next week in the rematch at Iowa. Who knows? But they hung around, lost by single digits in a game where Iowa shot 58% from three 
and they shot 27%. Those percentages are not going to be, it's not going to be a 30 percentage point gap a week from now when they play each other again. I guarantee that. And how about Jazz Shelley this year? Like, why, why aren't we hearing more about her? She's top 10 in wind shares in the country. Came over from Oregon where she, you know, was, was sort of found herself behind a lot of really talented players. Now she's like the alpha dog on this team, which, which has been awesome to the numbers that she's been able to put up 19, 10 and six with two and a half steals, almost two blocks, like just across the board. She's taking a lot of pressure, I think, off of some of the other players like Sam Hybe, who had to do a lot last year at Ashley Spoggy. And I think Amy Williams is clearly head and shoulders the front runner for Big Ten Coach of the Year right now. I think this team is going to be ranked at some point. I don't know when, uh, but it is only a matter of time. Yeah, Jess Shelley is really one of those players that is not going to give enough attention. I think she's been one of the best guards in the country right now, and I don't think I've seen her on any kind of watch list, anything like that. The, the Wooden Award just got their midseason 25 this week, which had an interesting selection of guards, I think, in comparison to who I would say it's one of the best guards. Country Shelley was one of the gl- glaring admissions from that. Another Big Ten guard, Veronica Burton, was another glaring admission from that list. Um, but yeah, she's just been fantastic. And then, like you said, they just didn't shoot the ball well from three today. That's not typical for them. They are shooting, I think, around 36% on the season that's 23rd in the country so typically a team that knocks down the three I don't think it was Iowa's defense that made the difference there (laughs) I'm just gonna go out on a limb there (laughs) so they hang right around there not shooting well to compared to an Iowa team that shot really well today Kayla Clark went off I think in a way we haven't necessarily necessarily seen her go off that many times this season but today she shot the ball really well I don't think there's much to hang their heads on in terms of this loss. They hung around with a, a really solid Iowa team. Oh, and McKenna Warnock shot seven for nine from three. Like, all respect to McKenna yeah. Warnock, who's a great compliment to, you know, Caitlin Clark and Monica Sonano. Like, she's not going to shoot seven for nine from three probably for the rest of the year, maybe the rest of her career. So, that you know, sometimes you just got to tip your cap and, and someone has a great day and you move on and, I think Nebraska is probably excited that they get in the rematch in a week and not a month because I, I think they know that they can beat this team, uh, you know, and I, I think they will. I, I think if even though the rematch comes on the road in Iowa, honestly, I, I'm picking Nebraska uh, come this coming week to win that game. And I want to get your take on something, too, uh, you know, back to Amy Williams being the coach of the year. So I think she's the coach of the year either way, recruiting or otherwise. But I think part of it to me, she brought in Jazz Shelley you know, in recruiting whether it's high school or transfer market to me is part of the part of what should factor into coach of the year. It's, it's a lot of, I think a lot of people disagree. I put this out on Twitter recently, like why people maybe don't think Dawn Staley is the coach of the year because she was supposed to be good and she is good. Well, she was supposed to be good because she recruited well. Right. So I want your take, like, do you think recruiting should be part of coach of the year discussions? And, you know, do you think that should fit the fact that Amy Williams was able to bring in such an impact transfer? Like, does that, should that help her in big 10 coach of the year? I think it should. I mean, recruiting is such a big part of coaching. Like, yes, it's only one part, but it's such a big part. Like, if you don't recruit good players, you're not going to be good. Like, it's, <laughs> like, there's, I don't know. Like, I feel like Gino always makes this joke that he's like, people are like, you only win the national championship when you have like the best players. It's like, yeah, that's like, that's how it works. You win when you have the best players. <laughs> so I absolutely think it should be part of it. I mean, it's not the whole picture. Like, there's something to be sad for like, taking talent that maybe isn't as good as another team has and bring it to a higher level but it recruiting still has to be part of it there's it's just such a big part of what makes up your team and how you're going to be able to take your team forward absolutely and you know I think Amy Williams has done both this year so I think what whether you're on our team or on you know the recruiting doesn't matter team I think either way Amy Williams is coach of the year but um yeah I was interested in your take on that I think I think she's done both fantastically well yeah, I agree. I mean, this team, I don't think anyone had Nebraska. I was like, a team we were going to be talking about is top 25 in, at, at any point or the preseason, but here we are. So, I mean, they've been fantastic. It's been really fun to watch. All right. One more big one from this game. One of the remaining undefeated teams in UNC lost their first game on Thursday night, so they didn't quite head into – the weekend undefeated, but they were earlier this week. UNC played at NC State. 
on Thursday, kind of the first like really top tier opponent we've seen them against. And you could tell it was the top 10 or the first top tier opponent they've played against because NC State just really blew them out. <laughs> There's not a nice way to put it. They got blown out. <laughs> I don't know if there is a nice way to put it. North Carolina didn't show up for this game. They scored 45 points. Uh, this game, I mean, to me, it does say a lot about NC State too. It's another team. Uh, our, our ratings have had them second for a while, you know, and they, I mean, NC State is, if you, if you think about, uh, they, they opened the season with a single digit loss to what everyone agreed then and still agrees now is the best team. Since then, their only loss came at the hands of, of Georgia, thanks to Sarah, Sarah Ashley Barker, you know, miracle shot the end of regulation. They'd be undefeated since South Carolina lost, not for that. This, this says a lot about NC State, but but yeah, I do think North Carolina, you know, this was on our podcast with Jen, preseason podcast, North Carolina was one of my teams that I put as being underrated because they weren't getting a single vote in the AP top 25. And they have finally gotten to the point where they're correctly rated and maybe a little bit overrated to where we can pump the brakes now. But I do think they're a top 25 team, at least borderline. Uh, and we saw that tonight, actually, in the game that they followed up with this NC State loss just an hour before we started recording here. They they flipped the script and did the same thing to Virginia Tech, who's not NC State, but it's a very quality Virginia Tech team. So obviously North Carolina can play. Uh, this may be somewhat of an aberration. I, I, you know, they're clearly not in that top tier where NC State is or maybe Louisville in the ACC, but they're, they're definitely a contender. I don't, I don't know what happened in this game. They just didn't show up. But um, I, I, I think somewhere in between what we saw from in, the NC State game and somewhere what we saw tonight in the Virginia Tech game is probably about where North Carolina is going forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I mean, they rebounded really well against Virginia Tech today, but also Virginia Tech didn't show up for that game. So it's kind of been, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. I had a take earlier today that Virginia Tech could play their way into being a top four seed, and I'm not feeling great about that right now. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I mean, they really, they were able to kind of rebound from this loss. So I think that's a good sign. I think it was probably a bit of a wake up call. They haven't played anyone at NC State's level yet this season. And it's the first time, plus you're doing it on NC State's home court loud arena it's a lot so I, I think that that's not totally ind indicative of where they are they're not at NC State's level for sure but I also don't think that they're like so below it that they're not a top 25 team I think it's just a, a bad loss but like you said I mean NC State has been fantastic also I think that's a big part of this as well they're a team that kind of got left out of that like top tier consideration at the beginning of the season everyone's like it's South Carolina it's UConn and it's Stanford, NC State didn't really get into that conversation, but I think they've demonstrated that they're definitely a part of that tier at this point. Part of that has just been their bench has been really, really solid this season. I think that's a big, a big thing for them, especially if you're going to win a title, you've got to have some depth. And I think we've definitely seen that from them so far this season. Diamond Johnson has just been fantastic. Yeah, and that was a problem for them last year was, was that depth. They had a great starting lineup, and, and sometimes when they had to go to the bench, they had that drop-off. And I think, you know, being able to bring Diamond Johnson off the bench for them, like you said, has been a huge spark plug in that second unit, which has really sort of put them over the hump. They've made a bunch of Sweet 16s in a row, three or four. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, and they've lost there every, every time. They haven't made the Elite Eight in forever. And I think that changes this year. Um, they're, they're going to get a one seed again. I believe they got a one seed last year and, and ran into, you know, Indiana in the one versus four game. They're going to get a one seed again. I do think they're going to make at least the elite eight um, because they sort of addressed that main concern, which was that bench, you know, where are you getting that production from the bench? And they're getting it from Diamond Johnson, which has been awesome. And, and you know, they were able, in this game, they were able to really frustrate North Carolina, you know, in the paint too. And North Carolina shot 10 for 44 inside the arc. 20, under 23% inside the arc. You just don't see that. Um, it, I mean, between, you know, between that and, and just the presence of Elisa Kunain in the post and NC State's shooting, which wasn't even at their best in this game. It was fine at 34%. But this is a team where most of the rotations in the 40s, uh, it's, it's going to be a really tough out in March. Yeah, and it was a really good game for Kunane, too. She had 19 points, 13 rebounds. I feel like she's been a, not quiet. I don't know what quiet is the world, but it's just a little quieter than we've seen her be in the past this season. She hasn't necessarily been at that, like, 
all American type post player level that we've seen. So she seems to be getting back to that a little bit, which is a good sign for NC State. But they've also just been able to get production from everyone else that it had. They haven't really missed the beat without her putting up those big numbers. Yeah, they have so many shooters around her spacing the floor, Diamond Johnson included, that, you know, she they've been able to be at least as good, I think, better than last year, maybe without even that, those sort of gaudy stat lines from uh, Lisa Cunane. Yeah, I definitely think they're better than last year, without a question. This team looks like a legit title cut contender. I don't know that I would have said that about NC State last year. Definitely, yeah, agree. All right, so that's going to do it for today. Lots of exciting action to cover there, but we've got another big week coming up. I mean, Thursday through Sunday again is going to be crazy. So we will be back again next Monday with a new episode. Thanks, Calvin, for joining me to kick off 2022. Yeah, Megan, thanks for having me. Well, that's all for today's episode. Thank you for listening. As always, make sure you rate, like, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening or watching us, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on YouTube. Also, be sure to check out the stats site, herhoopstats.com. We have all the NCAA stats that you need. Our, we have our own Her Hoop Stats rankings that rate all the teams in Division One as well as Division Two and Three as well. So definitely go check that out. It's just $20 a year to subscribe. Also, be sure you are subscribed to our newsletter on Substack. It's free and you get all of our written content directly to your inbox. And lastly, make sure you're following us on social, at Her Hoops Dads, on Twitter, on Instagram, the YouTube channel. Thanks again for listening.